In this video, I'm going to answer the question, is the Bonferroni correction really necessary? And I'm going to have a little bit of a preface to this video because I assume that you already have some knowledge about some key characteristics of statistics uh, in this video. So first of all, I'm going to assume that you already know what a Bonferroni correction is. And I'm also going to assume that you know what type 1 air inflation is. Uh, and if you don't have a decent understanding of those two things, then I encourage you to watch another video that I created, which is What is the Bonferroni Correction? where I describe the Bonferroni Correction. And I also talk about some of the background statistical concepts relevant to this video that I'm assuming that you understand. So I'm also going to preface this video with uh, the suggestion that really it's not just about the Bonferroni Correction because the Bonferroni correction is really only one approach to dealing with the multiple comparisons problem. Now I'm going to be focusing mostly on the Bonferroni correction, but it does have uh, consequences for all types of corrections that might be applied uh, to the multiple comparisons problem. And so I mentioned here that the multiple comparisons problem might be defined as uh, two or more statistical tests of the difference between two means on the same sample. So if you repeatedly conduct several uh, test of the difference between means on the same sample, you are faced with the multiple comparisons problem. But I personally like to think about it more broadly as the multiple analyses problem because you might actually carry out more than just tests of the difference between two means on a series uh, on one sample of data. You might carry out uh, correlations, regression, uh, tests of the difference between means. And as you're conducting those analyses on the same sample of data, possibly you are faced with the multiple analyses problem. So I'm also going to take two approaches to answering this question. And I'll encourage you now that if you only want to know my practical solution to this problem, or at least one of my suggested practical solutions to this problem, you might want to just go straight to slide 18 in this video, because that's where I'm going to start talking about that. Now before that, I'm going to talk about more of the nature of the problem and why some people might think it's necessary and why other people think it's not. I'm mostly going to be focusing on not necessary. So there are two approaches to dealing with this question and one of them is strictly statistical. And I can confidently ass assert that experts do not agree on the strict statistical uh, solution or answer to this question, is the Bonferroni correction really necessary? If you read the literature, you'll get different answers from people who I would consider are experts in this area. Now there's also a practical approach to answering this question, and there's also disagreement on how to deal with this problem or this question from a practical perspective. And as I mentioned, I give you my practical solution to this problem on slide 18 and uh, for a couple of slides after that. So, from a strictly statistical perspective, I think it's fairly safe to say that there is a fair amount of agreement that the family-wise, experiment-wise error rate increases across a collection of statistical analyses when they're conducted on the same sample of data. Now, I mentioned here family-wise and experiment-wise error rate. I'm assuming that you kind of have an idea of what that is based on that video that I, uh, based on uh, if you watched the video that I mentioned earlier or if you've read about it in previous uh, texts or journal articles, of course. So there are disagreements, however, on just about everything else. So yes, family-wise error rate might be increasing, but uh, by how much and is it a problem? Well, on that issue, there are substantial disagreements. So how do we even calculate the magnitude of the problem? Like family-wise error rate is increasing, well, by how much and is it a problem? So there's disagreements on even how to calculate that. So for example, does every single analysis you conduct on a single sample of data influence the family-wise error rate? There is not agreement on that question. And there's also disagreement on whether you can take into consideration the correlations between the dependent variables upon which you're conducting the analyses on the same sample of data. So for example, suppose you were testing the difference between four groups and you're, you had three dependent variables. And those three dependent variables were something like numerical span, word span, visual span. All three of those variables you would expect to be correlated positively, probably substantially, at least moderately. So as you're conducting those 
uh, an ANOVAs on those dependent variables, you're arguably not really conducting wholly new original analyses because they're intercorrelated with each other. Well, how do you take that into consideration with respect to the increase in family-wise error rate? There's no consensus on that question. There's not even consensus on whether you should take that into consideration. But there are people who argue that you should. Now, secondly, and, and to some degree relatedly, when it comes to family-wise error rate, which people seem to agree might be increasing to some extent, how do you even define a family of analyses? On that issue, there is disagreement. So here's an example where you might conduct a factorial between subjects ANOVA, and you've got two independent variables and one interaction term here. And here are some multiple comparison procedures conducted for the first independent variable, which was found to be statistically significant based on the omnibus ANOVA conducted over here. And then these are the follow-up multiple comparisons. Now, most people, I suspect, would uh, expect you to do some kind of protection uh, to uh, alleviate the problem of family-wise error rate on these multiple comparisons here. But what about the question of, should you be doing a Bonferroni correction or some kind of correction on the omnibus ANOVAs that you've conducted here? I, To be honest, I don't think I've ever come across a paper that's ever done that. But I have come across researchers who uh, stringently argue that you should. You should have to do a Bonferroni correction uh, relevant to these omnibus uh, statistics. And I think you can mount an argument theoretically that you should have to do that. But you can find people who argue that you don't. And so this is the issue that I'm mentioning is that there's not agreement on what constitutes a family of analyses on a set of data. So should you do the Bonferroni correction? Is it really necessary? Well, at what point and where? There's no consensus. So there's also disagreement on whether the Bonferroni correction and the family-wise error rate that's, uh, that arises as, as a result of doing multiple analyses is even a problem from a theoretical standpoint. So this is going beyond whether we know how to define a family. This is a more fundamental question. And I can find papers for you that uh, very critically review the Bonferroni correction. They don't like it one bit. And they would suggest, I think most cogently, that the Bonferroni correction does not test the hypothesis of interest. And so here's a, an example of a paper uh, by Perniger 1998, who says, who entitles his paper, What's Wrong with Bonferroni Adjustments, published in BMJ. And he writes, this paper advances the view widely held by epidemiologists. I'm not sure that's totally true, but that's what he says. That Bonferroni adjustments are at best unnecessary and at worst deleterious to sound statistical inference. And I can tell you that Perniger's biggest problem with the Bonferroni adjustment is that it isn't re relevant to a hypothesis of interest. And so he writes here, the first problem is that Bonferroni adjustments are concerned with the wrong hypothesis. The study-wide, or family-wise, error rate applies only to the hypothesis that the two groups are identical on all 20 variables. So this is across dependent variables, which is the universal null hypothesis. And Perniger argues the universal null hypothesis is not interesting. Uh, to probably anyone doing research. And he gives some other examples to prove his point. And I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested. Now this paper has been cited 4,302 times. So obviously there's some, a lot of people who are borrowing uh, Perniger's arguments to not use the Bonferroni adjustment. And you might be inclined to use it yourself uh, if you're in a position to want to defend yourself not using it. Now another paper uh, I've come across is Nakakawa, Nakagawa, who in 2004 uh, entitled a paper, A Farewell to Bonferroni. And his main problem is that the Bonferroni correction is too strict. And the more analyses you do and that you apply the Bonferroni correction to, the more underpowered your study is. And so he goes, it's unnecessarily underpowered to apply the Bonferroni correction. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Nakagawa says that you shouldn't do any protection whatsoever, but he is against the idea of using the Bonferroni. Uh, and he argues that people are, are probably increasing their type 1 error rate, or type 2 error rate, 
as a result of using the Bonferroni correction. And the bon type 2 error is one where you fail to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact false in the population. Now Nakagawa's paper also cited very heavily, 1,533 times. So this uh, question here that, I've has, uh, that I have as a subsidiary question to the is the Bonferroni correction really necessary is why is the Bonferroni type correction or Bonferroni type corrections applied or observed inconsistently across papers? And so I get this question from students who say, do I have to apply a Bonferroni correction or how come I don't see it consistently across papers? And I'll answer that question for you. And here's an example where you can see that uh, this correlation matrix is based on a relatively small sample size of 61. And there is no correction whatsoever on any of these correlations. You can see this correlation of negative 0.31 is significant. If you applied some kind of correction, it would not be. So this is based on a publication and got through a peer-reviewed journal. Now here's another uh, correlation matrix where you can see here in the note a sequential Bonferroni method was used to help protect against type 1 error inflation. And I think this table is particularly clever because they've included the non-corrected p-values for people to see. So all these correlations with stars are based on non-correction. And then in bold, they have the sequential Bonferroni method uh, correlations that are significant. So there's a bit of a balance between here's the significant stuff and here's the stuff that's been corrected based on a Bonferroni method. Now the sequential Bonferroni method is different than the ordinary Bonferroni method. Uh, I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. Uh, I suspect I'll make a video on that at some point. So why are Bonferroni corrections, or really any type of correction whatsoever, observed inconsistently across research? Well, it's because researchers, editors, and peer-reviewed uh, uh, reviewers of papers themselves do not agree on when it should be applied. Just like statisticians who research this area do not agree on each other if and when it should be applied. And so what Cabin and Mitchell did in 2000 is they actually sent five research scenarios to editors of journals and asked them to evaluate whether a Bonferroni type correction should be applied to those five research scenarios. And amongst other questions, they found that only one out of 18 of the editors was completely com comfortable with evaluating another person's use of the Bonferroni correction. So there's a lot of hesitation, a lot of trepidation about asserting some level of confidence. And that's because it's a complicated issue. And it's also because there's inconsistency in the theoretical and statistical literature on when and uh, if it should be used. Now I'll give you an example that out of the five research scenarios that the uh, Cabin and Mitchell gave the editors, there was only one research scenario for which there was at least 66% of agreement on whether they expected the use of a Bonferroni correction or not. That's a l very little agreement, uh, in my opinion, and that is why you see inconsistency in the literature. People don't understand and don't agree on when it should be used. So what can we do in practice? This is me giving you my practical recommendation to dealing with the issue of family-wise error rate and the possibility of using a Bonferroni correction or another one. So in my experience, I've never had a reviewer or editor quote-unquote force me to apply an adjustment for multiple statistical analyses on the same sample. And the question might be, why have I never had that thrown in my face? Well, I suspect that other reviewers who are authors themselves don't want anyone to throw that in their face when they're doing research. Because obviously when you apply the Bonferroni correction, you end up increasing the chances of committing a type 2 error, uh, but you also might lose a lot of statistically significant effects that you can't talk about in your discussion. It's not only that, though. It's not just because I think there's trepidation and people are a bit worried about having that, made, that accusation made about their own research. In practice, I don't really do a lot of statistical analyses on a single sample of data. And by that I mean I try to keep things a little contained. So here's an example where if you had a sample size of about 100 to 150, well, you could get away, I suspect, with doing one correlation matrix, a few t-tests, and two multiple regressions. My hunch is that most reviewers of your work will not raise an issue, a serious one, about the inflation of error, uh, the inflated uh, type 1 error rate in that case.
Now this is just a ballpark example of something. It's a little bit, it's obviously arbitrary in terms of the human experience of doing research. I have observed papers where they just do so many analyses on the same sample of data that I feel compelled as a reviewer to mention something. But when I review other papers where they keep things reasonably contained, I won't mention it. Now the other thing uh, to keep in mind is why not just acknowledge uh, the fact that you might not have strictly uh, e maintained family-wise error rate at 0 0.05 in your study. Just acknowledge it as a limitation in the discussion of your report or your manuscript. So you could write something like another limitation associated with this investigation is that the increase in family-wise error rate across the reported statistical analyses was not controlled. Overall, we consider this research relatively preliminary and encourage replication. That sort of statement will disarm, I suspect, 95% of reviewers who know about family-wise error rate and want people to take it at least semi-seriously. So if you maintain a relatively small number of analyses on your sample and you acknowledge that, look, there's probably some family-wise error rate increase in this study that I haven't controlled fully, you'll probably get away with writing up your paper and not having anyone object. So as a summary, strictly speaking, multiple statistical analyses will inflate family-wise error rate beyond per analysis alpha. I think there's consensus that it's happening. Uh, there's not much consensus on how much exactly. There is not much consensus on how to deal with it exactly. And there's also very inconsistent application in the literature with respect to Bonferroni or any other type of uh, multiple comparison procedure. Now, to the question, is the Bonferroni correction really necessary? Probably not. It probably isn't necessary, especially if you take the view that the Bonferroni is too strict. Now, you probably have to use something like a Tukey-Kramer uh, multiple comparison procedure if you do a one-way ANOVA and then follow up with, the multiple, uh, with a multiple comparison, although I should say the Tukey-Kramer is a single-step procedure, so you don't need to do the ANOVA first. And the same goes for the Bonferroni. So it's a balance here. You have to pay some mind to it. You should apply it uh, to some degree, especially when you're conducting multiple comparisons across means in a single uh, one-way ANOVA. But once you get beyond that, it becomes much more complicated. Uh, and so I hope you appreciate my practical solution to this problem. And if other people have comments about how they uh, view this issue, please feel free to make a comment uh, in the comments to this video.